Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salam wa sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Wa man istanna bi sunnati bi ihsanin la yawmidin Alhamdulillahi ladhi hadana li hadha wa makunna li nahtadi lawla an hadana Allah Allahumma ayna al-haq haqqan wa rizukna attiba'a wa ayna al-batila batilan wa rizukna jisinaab Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I would like to welcome you all to another session from the commentary on the 40 hadith of Al-Imam An-Nawi Rahimullah and we, by the Fadl of Allah, are now on hadith number 10, which is on the topic of purity. So without any further ado, let us begin. An Abi Hurairah radi anhu qal, qal Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Inna Allah tayyibun la yakbalu illa tayyiba, wa inna Allah amara al-mu'mineen bima amara bihi al-mursaleen fa qala ta'ala. Ya ayyuha ar-rusulu kulu min tayyibati wa'amalu saliha Wa qala ta'ala Ya ayyuha al-ladhina amanu kulu min tayyibati ma razaqanakum Thumma dhakara ar-rajula yutilu safara ash'ata aghbara yamuddu biyadayhi ila as-sama Ya rabbi ya rabb Wa mat'amahu haram Wa mashrabahu haram Wa malbasahu haram Wa ghudhiya bil haram Fa anna yusajabu lah Rawahu Muslim. Abu Hurairah radi anhu reported the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Verily, Allah the Exalted is tayyib, pure. He does not accept but that which is tayyib. Allah commands the believers, and what He commanded the messengers. Allah the Most High said, O you messengers, eat of the good things and act righteously. And Allah." Most High also said, O you who believe, eat of the good things that we have provided you with. Then he mentioned the man who having journeyed far is disheveled and dusty and who stretches out his hands to the sky saying, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabb, O Lord, O Lord, while his food is unlawful, his drink is unlawful, his clothing is unlawful and he is nourished with unlawful things. So how can he be answered? And this is in the collection of Sahih Muslim. Introduction, Muqaddimah, Purity of Actions. The Prophet says, Inna Allah tayyib la yakbalu illa tayyibah. So here, the Messenger of Allah says, Indeed Allah is tayyib. Tayyib is using the Quran and the Sunnah to describe actions, good deeds, people, and speech. Okay. This means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has all the attributes and characteristics which are completely pure and complete without any defect, weakness, or need. Well, the word tayyib in the Quran and the Sunnah describe actions, good deeds, people, things, and speech. This term linguistically means that something which is good, Ibn Rajab, rahimullah, interprets this word as tahir, or pure. This hadith also is considered a foundational hadith as many rulings of the deen revolve around it. Mentioned in this hadith is the command to eat from that which is good and halal, and that is the sanctuary of the messengers. And that the sanctuary of the Muslims is that also of the messengers. Also mentioned is the effect of eating from halal sources on a person's supplications, dua, and amal, good deeds. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure or tayyib. In other words, he is free from all defects and he is perfect in every manner. His statements are the best statements and his actions are full of wisdom. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also tayyib from the angle that he is perfect in his names and attributes. He is also perfect in the angle that all acts of worship should be directed to him alone. So in this way, we see that in Allah tayyib. And as we continue, then he, Prophet says, لا يقبل إلا طيبة. He does not accept anything but which is pure. So this phrase, 
means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept deeds which are not performed for His sake. Okay? This is even if the deeds on the exterior appear to be for His sake only, but in actuality contain defects in niya and sincerity. Remember the first hadith, remember also the ending of one of the other prior hadiths, وَحِسَابُهُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى so in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be the judge and He will judge you for your deeds. Despite the fact that everyone on the earth may recognize whatever you're doing as good or great. So actions may not be acceptable if they originate from sources which are impure. And this is also where this hadith focuses in on. And that is the focus of this hadith. For example, donations and sadaqat or sadaqa to Islamic causes in the form of money but from haram sources will not be accepted by Allah Azawajal. Furthermore, the statement La yakbalu illa tayyibah can have other meanings as well. Okay? In general, it has three different meanings. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not reward the action. Okay? And this is most cases in terms of the application of this hadith onto a certain action or mal. An example of this is in the hadith found in Sahih Muslim where the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever visits a soothsayer, his prayer will not be accepted for 40 days. In this case, the person still has to perform the prayer for the 40 days as he still has to comply with the obligation of praying. But he will not be rewarded for those prayers. That is, the action will be considered performed, but he will not be rewarded for it even though he has fulfilled the command of the salah. Okay, for example, he does not have to redo the action. Number two, another meaning of la yakbalu illa tayyiba is that the action of worship will be rendered null and void. An example of this is that the that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept the salah of a woman who can menstruate, yani who is mature, except that she has to wear a headscarf. Okay, this is based on the Hassan Hadith in Tirmidhi and Abu Dawood. And there's another Hadith where Abu Huraira narrates and also found in Sahih Bukhari where the Prophet says, Allah does not accept the prayer of any of you if he becomes ritually impure until he performs the wudu. So in these cases, the phrase does not accept means that the action is rendered void unless the respective condition is met. And yet, a third meaning of la yakbalu illa tayyiba is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not pleased with the action. Okay. So as for tayyib or good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts it, meaning that He is pleased with it, rewards it and actually accepts the action as sound and completed. And this also includes beliefs, statements and actions. So what is Good belief, good statement, and good action. Firstly, good means that which is free from defect or deficiency from the perspective of the Sharia. So the good statement is that which is in conformity with the Quran and Sunnah. Likewise, the good action is that which is correct, has a correct intention behind it, and is also in accordance with the Sunnah. Okay. So if a matter is considered good, it will not be considered from the khabait or the filthy or the bad. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ma'idah, قل يستوي الخبيث والطيب ولو أعجبك كثرة الخبيث. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Not equal are the evil and the good, although the abundance of evil might impress you." So continuing, eat from the pure. So continuing with this hadith. Eat of the tayyibat. In Surah Al-Mu'minun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala command the messengers, Ya ayyuha rusulu kulu min tayyibati wa'amalu saliha. O messengers, eat of the tayyibat and do good deeds. In Surah Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu kulu min tayyibati ma razaqanakum. O oh, you who believe, eat of the tayyibat, that which we have provided you with. So this shows the effect of food on one's good deeds. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded these two issues in one statement. For that there must be a connection between the two parts of the verse. And this hadith also emphasizes that you are what you eat. So whatever you put in your mouths, if it's from an impure source, then that dua 
it may not be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is huge. Not only that, the food may be halal, but the source from which you buy the food, if it's haram also, then what you put into your body and nourish it with also becomes غير طيب, not pure, impure. So, كُلُوا مِن طَيِّبَاتِ مَا رَزَقَنَاكُمْ Okay, the criteria for acceptance of our deeds by Allah Azza wa Jal are the following. Number one, that the money that one earns needs to be pure and halal. Number two, the food that is consumed also must be halal and permissible. Number three, the money that one buys food with must also be lawful, coming from lawful sources and means. For example, the zakah will not be accepted unless it is given from the halal wealth. Likewise, whoever performs hajj with unlawful wealth, cheating, usurping wealth, his hajj is not accepted. But the question of something becoming or being permissible, prohibited, is decided only by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is only Allah's right to declare something lawful or otherwise. No one else has the right to make this declaration. Only Allah and His Messenger. Okay. So consuming pure food. Okay. Another principle extracted from this hadith relates to being careful about the food that we consume. It needs to be from halal sources. For example, a food item cannot have picked products such as gelatin, glycerin, lard, etc. There are cases where you can have gelatin from a halal source or glycerin from a halal source, but in general, we have to assume it is from uh, pork products unless proven otherwise. Another issue is with food that can create problems with our health. Many preservatives and compounds such as, for example, fructose corn syrup, okay, chemicals, etc. are unhealthy. Foods which contain harmful contents are not tayyib. Okay. Now, this doesn't mean that it makes them haram per se. No. But we should, even among the halal foods, there are things which are in general healthy for us and there are foods, if we consume them too much or regular basis, they can be harmful. So we have to be cognizant also of that fact. Not everything which is halal is necessarily tayyib because it can have potential for harm. For example, the Prophet ﷺ says, مَا مَلَى آدَمِيٌّ وِآءً شَرًّا مِن بَطْنِ بِحَسْبِ بِنِ آدَمَ أُكُلَاتٌ يُقِمْنَا صُلْبَهُ فَإِنْ كَانَ لَا مَا حَلَتَ فَثُلُطُ لِطَعَامِهِ وَثُلُطٌ the human does not fill any container that is worse than his stomach. Bibatni. It is sufficient for the son of Adam to eat that which will support his back. If this is not possible, then a third for food, a third for drink, and a third for his breath. And this is a beautiful, healthy hadith which really sums up the ideal diet. I mean, there can be nothing better than this diet that the Prophet has laid down 1400 years ago for us and humankind. And this hadith also is sahih and is narrated in Jamia Tirmidhi. So another principle extracted from this hadith by scars is with regards to the trust of public or private utilities. We have to remember that this is similar to the property of another person or entity. And this is related to ghulul, which generally means stealing booty or zakah funds or the Muslim treasury or the like. Note that it also occurs when unlawfully taking something from the property of a company, organization or institution, be it Muslim or non-Muslim, any property taken from these tangible resources is ghulul. This is an important issue because ghulul is a major sin. Today, many Muslims, unfortunately, take this issue of ghulul for granted. Examples include stationery, taking stationery from the office, personal use of company photocopy machine, improperly using the phone, improperly using funds for personal things, or taking other materials without getting the permission from the owner. Furthermore, we are responsible for any damage or vandalizing that we do of the property, be it private or public. This is important because this is an amana. Everything has an amana and trust to it. 
And as Muslims, we have to be cognizant and do the amana of the big things and also of the small things. So thus, khulul is essentially a kind of theft which is done illegally. In fact, if one commits khulul, it is not expiated even if one performs jihad for the sake of Allah until one pays it back. And this is directly related from a hadith about a martyr who took a piece of cloth from the booty of war as narrated by Abu Hurairah an. He mentions that when we conquered Khaybar, we gained neither gold nor silver as booty, but we gained goods, food, and clothes. Then we departed with Allah's Messenger وسلم, to the valley of al kira And at that time, Allah's Messenger had a slave of his called Rifa'a ibn Yazid who had been presented to him by a man who had leprosy. While the slave was dismounting the saddle of Allah's Messenger وسلم, an arrow came and hit him. The people said, congratulations on his martyrdom. However, Allah's Messenger said, Bala. Walladi nafsi bi yadi. Inna shamalata lati asabaha yawma khaybara min al maghanimi lam tusibhal maqasimu latashta'ilu alayhi nara. No, by him in whose hand is my soul, he had a sheet of cloth which he had taken illegally on the day of Khaybar from the booty before its distribution and has become a flame of fire burning him. So here the Prophet ﷺ immediately recognized the destination of this person and it was shown to him by Allah what he had done just for a piece of cloth. Then what about these other things? I mean, there are people who are raking millions, amana of Muslims, whether they be like leaders or whatnot. I mean, you have the Panama Papers. It's sickening how people who are immensely wealthy still usurping so much of the money and the wealth of innocent Muslims around the world or innocent people around the world. And this person who was a martyr really and yet still this was not enough to atone for that piece of cloth that he stole illegally from the booty of Khaybar. What about us? What about others? This is a very serious issue. Amana. It is not a light matter. Another beautiful example of how we should be cautious about the private and public utilities comes from the example of Umar bin Abdul Aziz Radha'an, the fifth rightly guided Khalifa. While performing his public duty, he would light up a candle that he brought with the money from Bayt al-Mal the entrusted Muslim treasury. He bought a second candle from his own money that he used for his personal affairs. Hence, whenever he finished acting in his public office, he would stop using the candle of Bayt al-Mal and use his personal candle. Look at the taqwa and the great care of the amana of Umar bin Abdul Aziz, who is recognized by the Ummah as the fifth rightly guided Khalifa. So such notable Actions and etiquettes should be emulated in this case of the stationery and items from our offices which we are employed in. Okay? And they should be only used when performing duties or within the scope of our employment. Furthermore, we should ensure that we, for example, switch off lights and other public utilities. Such practices will allow us to become better Muslims and ensure that our dua will be answered by Allah Azawajal. This also helps in terms of da'wah the da'wah, that we are honest people. We are people who can be trusted. We care for amana. We are there for the betterment of who we are working for as well. So it's important that awareness must be raised among Muslims to be more responsible and not to indulge in things which are hulul, which is unlawful usage of utilities and trusted by us by others, but also that we don't put extra hours in which we did not do or work if you're recompensed for certain trips, not to use that money for anything personal outside the scope of our work and employment. All this is important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching us. The big things and the little things. You know, we can't fool Him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's just as travesty if you are doing the greater good and the haq, but in the small little matters you're cheating. Because in the end, it will just come to bite you. As in the case of this slave 
who was literally shaheed, and everyone recognized that he was entering Jannah, but no, but the Messenger saw something which obstructed him from that, and indeed, Ma'adullah, there was a fire burning him just for a piece of cloth. Just for a piece of cloth. So, turning to another related topic is accepted sadaqah. Another ruling from this hadith is that sadaqah is only accepted by Allah if it comes from lawful sources. This is based on the statement, Allahu tayyib. So wealth that is obtained from unlawful sources cannot be given a sadaqah or be used in performing any form of worship. To do that, it will just the act of worship will be rendered void. An example of this is when a person uses unlawful money to perform the hajj. Okay. In this context, Ibn Abbas Anhuma had stated, filth does not expiate filth. So who are we trying to fool? So, according to scars, if someone stole money, then it must be returned and not be given away as sadaqah. This is particularly applicable in the case of the person who wants to do tawbah after committing theft or stealing. The person must return the money to the rightful owner. However, there may be cases where this is not possible, such as when the owner is not known or cannot be found, or perhaps the thief or the person who did theft may perceive that they may be injured if they give that back. You know, something really detrimental can happen. Then perhaps in this case, some scholars are of the opinion that the money can be given or equivalent money can be given in terms of what was stolen as sadaqah on the owner's behalf or be used for public benefits such as, for example, making roads, schools, etc. So there's a way out for everything, you know. When you compromise the haq of someone else, you have to give it back to that person. You know, there's the vertical relationship and there's also the horizontal relationship. The vertical relationship, we can just do tawbah because Allah subhanahu is ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and He accepts any sincere tawbah. But if there's a major sin which compromises the horizontal relationship between your fellow Muslim brothers or even non-Muslims, then you have to give them back that haq. That is a prerequisite. Then the hadith continues. The Prophet says, ثُمَّ ذَكَرَ الرَّجُلَ يَوْطِينُ السَّفَرَ أَشْعَةَ أَغْبَرْ وَيَمُدُّ يَدَيْهِ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ يَا رَبِّ يَا رَبْ And the Prophet mentions the example of a man who, who travels a long distance. He is unkempt. And he raises his hands to his Lord to the Sama' and says, Oh my Lord, my Lord. Okay, here the Prophet mentioned these characteristics of a person who is supplicating because they are usually characteristics which help in the dua being accepted. When a person travels, for example, his dua is more likely to be answered. As mentioned in the hadith in Bayhaqi, which is authentic, where the Prophet said, There are three prayers that are not rejected the prayer of a father for his child the prayer of the fasting person, and the prayer of the traveler. Okay. So having journeyed far, يُطِيلُ safar okay, is mentioned because when a person has traveled far, he is in a strange land away from his family. So his heart becomes soft, and he realizes his dependence on Allah, saying, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabb, O Lord, O Lord. And here, Lord, you have to understand the meaning is not equivalent to Lord, as in English, Lord means creator, sustainer, and malik, the owner. Okay, it's a very multifaceted meaning and a very important attribute also of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is our Rabb. So his heart is more connected to Allah. This feeling in the heart is from among the greatest causes for someone's supplication to be accepted. So the dua has to be heartfelt. It can't be just an utterance which has no connection to the heart. Copying a dua which someone is reciting out loud in the congregation where you have no idea what's going on, no attention. It has to be connected to the heart. And this is a dua which is accepted. Okay. Furthermore, as we see, Ash'ata wa Aghbar is disheveled and dusty. These characteristics also imply modesty and humbleness and simplicity and show that this person is not arrogant. An arrogant person, furthermore, is less likely to even do sincere du'a. 
Okay, because he, he feels himself as self-sufficient. Okay, so we have to make sure this really, we are not self-sufficient. We are completely dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, who spreads his hands to the sky. Another characteristic which is recommended during making dua. The Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said, Allah is shy to turn away empty the hands of his servant when he raises them to him. And this is authentic in the books of Ahmad and Abu Dawood. And so the one who spreads out his hands to the sky, يَمُدُّ yadehi إِلَى sama, Because you show your dependence to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So adab of making dua. Okay, dua is a direct communication to Allah Azawajal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Baqarah, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبَ أُجِيبُ الدَّعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانَ فَاسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَالْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ So this is a beautiful ayah of the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبَ And when they ask you about me, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبَ And this is different than many of the, the other ayahs Whenever it was a question asked to the Prophet ﷺ directly, he was told by Allah, Qul this, Qul that, say this, say that. But here the Qul is mahduf, it is omitted. Why? Why is it omitted? Because when it's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fa'inni qareeb, there's no Qul fa'inni qareeb, because there's no barrier between Allah and us. This is dua. Ujibu da'wati da'i da da'an. I answer the prayer of the one who asks. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُ بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ So the beautiful ayah of the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I am indeed near. And the one who asks will be answered. Okay. Furthermore, in another hadith, وَأَنُّمَانْ بِالْبَشِيرُ وَلِعَنْهُ Narrated the Messenger of Allah sallallahu wa sallam said, الدُّعَاءُ هُوَ الْإِبَادَةِ a dua, it is ibadah. But this is really very beautiful because you don't even need to even raise your hand. You don't even need to open your mouth or mute, make an utterance. Just some sincere dua inside in your tongue. And you connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dua is a direct connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't even need to have wudu to do dua. We, it can be done any time of the day. It can be done as we're going to the bathroom, we're exiting it. It could be done when we're in the company of our wife. We should remember and try to practice the adhkar and the dua of the Prophet ﷺ from morning to night, insha'Allah. Okay. And so, a dua huwa al-ibadah. It is worship. It is worship. Okay. And this hadith is narrated by the four imams and a tirmidhi narrated as sahih. So eating and consuming in a halal manner is an important prerequisite for the acceptance of our dua by Allah Azawajal. In addition, there are other situations mentioned when dua is more likely to be accepted. For example, when one is sick, during the prostration towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the swala, during rain, during the last third also of the evening or the night. Like for example, when you do tahajjud. Okay. And all these are opportunities which should not be disregarded since these are times when our dua is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we need all the help that we can get in terms of acceptance of our dua. Okay. So the adab or manners of dua are also mentioned in this hadith and it is important to realize that dua itself has its own etiquettes and mannerisms. Failure or observing these adab may result in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not responding to our dua also. So we should be humble. We should erase any pride or arrogance. Our hands should be raised or turned out, outstretched. Again, similar to how a beggar asks when in need. Furthermore, the dua is started using his omnipotent attributes and names. We are forever in need of Allah's assistance and guidance and mercy regardless of the time and day. And in every movement that we make, furthermore, we are in need of His mercy more than our need of the air that we breathe. Okay. But despite this, despite all these, you know, this beautiful thing about dua, the direct connection, all these ahadith, 
despite this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may still not respond to our dua if our food and earnings are not pure and halal. And that is the point of this hadith. That is the point of this hadith. Such a key ibadah, critical aspect of our connection to Allah is lost because we foolishly indulge in the haram, put haram morsels of things in our mouth to nourish us with, have haram earnings, whether they be big or small, they all can ruin this. Okay. So, conclusion of this hadith, the main point is that we need to consume food which is tayyib and in the right manner as prescribed in this religion of Islam. The status of tayyib, that which is pure, is attained when we ensure that we are earning, eating and drinking from the tayyibat in addition to giving sadaqah from it. This then will allow our actions to be pure and tayyib as well and be among those who are tayyibun, pure and blessed by Allah Azawajal. And doing this will inshallah lead us to become better Muslims with better iman and a pure heart devoted to Allah. Then everything that we do can be described as tayyib. And in conclusion, the effects of haram can also be seen in our actions supplications. So we cannot have double standards in this religion. May Allah give us tawfiq and allow us to implement whatever we have heard and seen from the great lessons from this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ and the ayat that we have recited as well. And also here we have some questions which should be good litmus tests in terms of your understanding of this hadith and the lessons and hikam also which are extrapolated from it. With this, inshallah, we will conclude. Jazakallah khairan for your attendance. Subhanaka lahu wa hamdik wa nashhad wa la ila illa ant wa sakfu wa tubu wa lake wa hasbuna wa na'mal wa kila salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.